Our Opium Wars, The Ghosts of Empire in the Prescription Opioid Nightmare, by Max Haven. This essay will appear in a forthcoming issue of Third Text in 2019. This audio file is a production of Rival, the Reimagining Value Action Lab, a workshop for the radical imagination, social justice, and decolonization based at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay and active around the world. For more information, please visit us online at www.rival.lakeheadu.ca. We must study how colonization works to decivilize the colonizer, to brutalize him in the true sense of the word, to degrade him, to awaken him to buried instincts, to covetousness, violence, race hatred, and moral relativism. A universal regression takes place. A gangrene sets in. A center of infection begins to spread. A poison has been instilled into the veins of Europe, and slowly but surely, the continent proceeds towards savagery. M. A. Césaire, Discourse on Colonialism. Part 1. Around 15 years before the Common Era, Caesar Augustus commissioned the construction of the Temple of Dendur on the upstream banks of the Nile River in an area that today is covered by Lake Nasser. Augustus had his image prominently engraved on the outer walls of the temple in the garb of an ancient Egyptian pharaoh making an annual sacrifice to the gods Isis and Osiris, whose marriage symbolized the cycle of fertility of the Nile Valley. The Romans knew that power was sustained not merely through military domination, and not only by gaining the consent of the governed, but also by exploiting dependencies. In this case, the reliance of the local population on ritual offerings to ensure the annual return of the generative waters to an otherwise arid region. Two millennia later, on the 10th of March 2017, that same Temple of Dender is now surrounded by bodies lying prone, empty pill bottles scattered around them. We are in the Sackler Wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the world's new imperial capital, New York City, where the temple was re-erected in 1978. It was relocated in 1963 through a UNESCO-facilitated program whereby the Egyptian government, led by Gamal Abdel Nasser, awarded many such doomed temples as gifts to nations who had helped Egypt create the monumental Aswan Dam, their ancient site soon to be submerged by the iconic megaproject. Aswan defied the ancient gods and brought the Nile's rhythms under human command, and also demanded the forced relocation of countless Nubian villagers in Egypt and Sudan. The bodies that now lie prone are protesting another human-created flood, another empire. The Sackler Wing, like dozens of museums around the world, bears the infamous name of a family estimated to be among the richest in America, generous if narcissistic philanthropists whose fortune derives almost entirely from the privately held company Purdue Pharma, the patent holder, aggressive marketer, and beneficiary of OxyContin, the prescription opioid painkiller that hooked America. The honorary leader of this protest is the artist Nan Golden, well known since the 1970s for her unflinching photographic portraits of those marginalized from New York's booming real estate and tourist culture, drug users, queer folks, drag queens, and, later, those who would be liquidated by the AIDS epidemic to make way for the bold new capitalist Manhattan of the 1980s and 90s. In late 2017, following a series of revelatory articles about the Sacklers and their empire of pain in Esquire and The New Yorker, Golden announced that she too was recovering from a destructive addiction to OxyContin, which had initially been prescribed to her by her doctor for post-surgical pain. Like so many doctors, hers had been beguiled by research provided by Purdue and its competitors that promised prescription opioids as miracle drugs, a non-addictive painkiller that could be liberally prescribed. Golden, like millions of others, became an increasingly desperate addict, crushing pills to defeat the patented time-release mechanism, gaming her prescription to access the drug at multiple pharmacies, and replacing or augmenting the drug with street heroin. Her candid revelations and new photographic series about her addiction helped to catalyze the activist group Pain Sackler, which has joined up with other movements in New York, like ACT UP, with experience targeting the reckless profiteering of the pharmaceutical industry, and shaming the Sackler family through performative actions like the die-in at the Temple of Dendur, the jewel in the crown of the family's philanthropic efforts. 
By demanding that the Sacklers use their ill-begotten wealth to fund rehabilitation programs, Payne Sackler has crystallized a recent debate on how to approach a contemporary art world whose most prominent patrons are the corporations and oligarchs of a global capitalist empire. Protests against the sponsorships of London's Tate Britain by British Petroleum and of the Metropolitan Museum by the far-right Koch brothers bear witness to precarious art and culture workers struggling to defy the art washing of corporate images and casts a wrench into the gears of bourgeois vanity whereby the treasures of the past become branded monuments to the destruction of today's civilizations and environment in the name of profit. Part 2 Free trade is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is free trade, announced Sir John Bowering, an acolyte of utilitarian philosopher and inventor of the panopticon prison, Jeremy Bentham. A reputed scholar and reformer who advocated liberal causes during his time as a UK member of parliament, Bowering's pivotal role as governor of Hong Kong and key player in the Opium Wars came about ironically as the result of his ruin by financial speculation which led him to take up the Asian post in service of the empire from 1854 to 1859. His association of free trade with divine provenance cunningly combined white supremacist conservative religious values with liberal notions of cosmopolitanism and the progressive rationality of the market. The retrograde Chinese empire must, he argued, be forced to accept the bittersweet medicine of British-produced opium at the point of a bayonet if need be, so as to be able to gain the civilizing influence of commercial trade. Never mind that the scourge of opium addiction was withering away the lives of millions of Chinese people, that its cancerous spread through the King Empire was corroding the social and political fabric. Never mind that opium itself was produced under drastic and well-nigh totalitarian conditions by and for the East India Company. It was the fulcrum by which British and other European nations half a world away could exploit and drain the resources of the world's wealthiest and most populous nation. Bowering's slogan became the justification for the Second Opium War of 1856 to 1860, a reprisal expedition for the audacity of the King Empire, then in the grips of a massive civil war remembered as the Taiping Rebellion, daring to seize a British ship thought to be a pirate vessel. In reality, this incident was understood by all parties as an attempt by the king to gain some sovereignty and prevent the further importation of opium. In revenge for this affront, British and French forces plundered and destroyed the emperor's marvelous summer palace in what is now Beijing, popularizing a word recently appropriated from Hindi during the brutal British reprisal against the Indian population for the anti-colonial rebellions of 1857. Loot. The treasures of the Chinese empire were systematically divvied up by the officers and crated and shipped to Paris and London to remain in family collections, to be sold as exotic curios, or to be given as gifts to secure political and economic favors. Priceless Chinese artifacts representing the legacy of 4,000 years of Chinese civilization flowed steadily out of China in the era that, of that nation's, quote, great humiliation, unquote spearheaded by the narco-capitalist Western exploitation of the Opium Wars. Perhaps the most famous and prolific collectors of these artifacts in the 20th century were the three Sackler brothers who founded Purdue Pharma. Many are today held in the Sackler wing of the Met, near the Temple of Dendur. Some might be in the galleries that surround the Sackler Courtyard at London's Victoria and Albert Museum, or in the Sackler Chinese collections at the Smithsonian in Washington or Princeton Universities. Part 3. The House of Sackler is not in order. In the 1960s, the three brothers, sons of Jewish immigrants to the New York borough of Queens who made good as doctors, were unified in their support of the building of the Met Sackler Wing. A few years later, and the eldest of the three, Arthur, split with his brothers and his side of the family divested themselves of Purdue stock before the company even introduced to OxyContin. This fact is often cited in public statements by Elizabeth Sackler, Arthur's daughter, one of the prominent patrons of feminist art and a scholar and activist for the repatriation of sacred artifacts to indigenous people in North America. Arthur, nevertheless, is remembered as the father of modern medical marketing, the high-pressure and seductive sales techniques that companies like Purdue use to popularize branded pharmaceuticals. The infamy of the Sackler name cannot be so easily diluted. The opioid crisis is arguably the largest human-caused public health crisis in American history, possibly world history. 
Since its onset at the end of the 20th century, at least half a million people have died from opiate-related causes. The Center for Disease Control explains that doctors wrote 72.4 prescription opioids per 100 persons in 2006. This rate increased 4.1% annually from 2006 to 2008 and 1.1% annually from 2008 to 2012. It then decreased 4.9% annually from 2012 to 2016, reaching a rate of 66.5 per 100 persons in 2016. In that year, 19.1 per 100 persons received one or more opioid prescriptions, with the average patient receiving 3.5 prescriptions a year. The report also estimates that at least 4.7 out of every 100 Americans misuse prescription painkillers, contributing to the estimates that, in 2015, prescription opioids were involved in 63.1% of the record-setting 52,404 recorded deaths from drug overdoses in the world's richest country. Indeed, it is a prime cause in one of the most startling statistics in recent years, the now steady year-over-year -year decline in the life expectancy of white women, the healthiest demographic in the country. In 2007, Purdue Pharma was forced to settle a multi-million dollar class action lawsuit by vic victims of OxyContin for misleading doctors and other health professionals into believing that the drug was safe to prescribe generally for pain. While the company admitted no wrongdoing, this began a slow turn against what was once trumpeted as the turning point in medical treatment, a non-addictive painkiller. But as the flood of prescription opioids receded and legal supplies began to dry up, though Purdue continues to market the drug aggressively in emerging economies like India and Brazil, many users turned to illicit street drugs, notably the notorious potent fentanyl which is typically manufactured in semi-legal laboratories in China and is so concentrated that mass quantities are relatively easy to smuggle into the U.S. among the tonnage of other imports of that world-defining logistics route. The active opioid agent in OxyContin did not come from Afghanistan, as one might presume, but more likely from the highly securitized fields of Tasmania, the Australian island where genocide against those deemed savage enemies of progress was completed in 1840. Still, the abundance of cheap heroin in Afghanistan contributed to the addiction of many American soldiers, mostly poor and working-class kids, stationed there, and they brought home after demob. Meanwhile, OxyContin and other prescription painkillers were widely prescribed by army doctors for the same reason that they were to athletes, financiers, surgeons, and traveling musicians. They allowed for the continued extraction of skilled and specialized labor time beyond the body's conventional limits, working through the pain. As Lauren de Sutter notes, capitalist accumulation has always relied on, perhaps even been defined by, the incorporation of narcotics which dull the pain of its toll on the body and render it ready for ever greater exploitation. Four. The faces of the opioid crisis are diverse, urban or rural, of all complexions, young and old. It involves bored suburban teenagers raiding their parents' medicine cabinets for a quick high, indebted retirees transformed into drug dealers when they realized the street prices of their prescribed painkillers could supplement their impossibly low pensions, injured or idled workers seeking disability insurance and opioids to help combat a sense of uselessness and alienation, overworked doctors ignorant of or denied the ability to offer holistic therapies, reaching for a panacea or being threatened or pressured by the patients, desperate for a fix. While those suffering addiction come from all ethnic backgrounds and tax brackets, the story of prescription opioids like OxyContin is usually told about the rot in the American white heartland, the staggering rates of prescription and addiction throughout the deindustrialized Rust Belt and Appalachia. The fact that the disproportionate majority of deaths and suffering are exhibited by white people is one reason the political discovery of the opioid crisis in the second decade of the 21st century has tended to stress users as innocent victims in need of rehabilitative services. This is in stark contrast to earlier waves of opioids like street heroin or crack cocaine, which disproportionately ravaged black urban communities in the 20th century, or the height of the AIDS epidemic, which disproportionately affected gay and intravenous drug users. Whereas these groups are, in the cultural politics of racial capitalism, suspected of deserving the plague inflicted upon them, the opioid crisis is presumed to have struck the innocent, hard-working, law-abiding representatives of the white American quintessence. 
Neo-Nazis are even reviving anti-Semitic conspiracy theories of poison-peddling Jewish doctors, with reference to the Sackler family heritage. The demographic reality is that black people in the United States seem to have been spared this crisis, but this is thanks to a dark web of causes that all derive from systemic and structural racism. Many black families lack access to doctors and medical insurance plans that would provide them with opioid prescriptions, a major influence on the statistics. Several studies have demonstrated that doctors ignored, downplayed, or distrusted black patients' testimonies of pain. Some doctors felt that their black patients were more likely to abuse or resell opioids than patients of other ethnic backgrounds. These statistics add credence to broader arguments that the medical establishment is so saturated with racist prejudices that doctors either misjudge the intensity of black people's testified pain or implicitly believe that black people can and therefore should endure greater pain. This presumption inherits the legacy of American medical pioneers like J. Marion Sims, the father of modern gynecology who conducted excruciating surgical experiments on enslaved and free black women without anesthetic in the late 19th century. Demographer Shannon Monat's research has found that the swing of voters from Barack Obama in 2012 to Donald Trump in 2016 was highest in counties that had elevated rates of mortality related to drug and alcohol abuse and suicide. So-called deaths of despair germane to poor, deindustrialized, rural, and largely white populations. Journalists and researchers of the opioid epidemic confirm the trend based on systematic, though anecdotal, investigations. Somehow, the opioid crisis is connected to the rise of a kind of vengeful, nihilistic politics highly indexed to the long-standing cultural and material patterns of a white supremacist nation and by the realization of the death of the American dream for its one-time beneficiaries. Part 5. In her enlightening rereading of the final passages of Walter Benjamin's celebrated The Work of Art in the Age of Its Mechanical Reproduction, cultural theorist Susan Buck Morris has convincingly argued that her Marxist predecessor's concern for the fate of aesthetics under the industrial capitalism was not, as is commonly imagined, primarily concerned with art. Rather, Benjamin had in mind the politics of what Buck Morris calls the capitalist sensorium, the way rapid urbanization, industrialization, and technological change both depend on and are shaped by the transformation of proletarian bodies as sensing, feeling entities. She points to the rise of new entertainment technologies, new sonic experiences, both artistic, that is movies, phonographs, and radio, and ambient, the din of the factory or the city and the casualized bodily violence of the factory work and urban life, which took both a slow toll on the laboring body and often enacted swift bodily harm in accidents. She observes that the rise of industrial capitalism was defined not only by new aesthetics in the field of mechanically reproduced culture, but also by the proliferation of pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical anesthetics methods by which proletarians could dull their torqued, sensing bodies to survive the accelerating, mediatic, and haptic onslaught of capitalism. This, for Buck Morris, is the key to understanding the haunting final lines of Benjamin's essay, where he meditates on the rise of fascism in his time. Fascism, while doing nothing to alleviate the pain and sensory overload of the proletariat, gives bombastic expression to their suffering. The hyperbolic participatory spectacles and maximalist, effectively consuming pageantry of fascism represented the aestheticization of politics, not just the transformation of politics into a hypernationalist spectacle, but of a politics calibrated to exploit the fractured, wounded, rewired sensorium of the industrialized, self anesthetizing body. Benjamin argued that the body and body politic come to delight in the spectacle of its own annihilation eagerly careening towards a self-destructive orgy of violence and the immolation of the individual in the forge of the vengeful mass. But Morris ends by reiterating Benjamin's urgent invitation, in the name of socialism that opposes barbarism, to imagine the politicization of aesthetics, not simply the creation of avowedly or explicitly political art, but the politically considered mobilization of the aesthetic-sensing subject of the new capitalist sensorium, Benjamin rightly worried that the 19th century bourgeois theories of the monadic, rational, self-contained subject were inadequate to understand, let alone liberate, a mediatic proletariat that had become a very different animal indeed. 
Recent neuroscientific discoveries about the plasticity of the brain reinforce this point. The task before us, then as now, is to mobilize ourselves as animals capable of rewiring ourselves, just as it is to recognize how deeply and profoundly we have been rewired by the everyday traumas of our economic and social systems, systems whose fractured, accelerated, digitally mediated sensorium makes that of Benjamin's era look almost humane by comparison. Silicon Valley tech firms sell advertisers the knowledge of how much of a user's attention, parceled by the millisecond, it takes for the brain to recognize a brand image. Meanwhile, selling data about our most visceral and spontaneous reactions, eye movements, variations in scrolling speeds to the highest bidder. Cambridge Analytica, which allegedly brought Trump to power, is only the tip of an iceberg of this new sensorium. It is joined by an increasing casualization and commodification of violence, especially sexualized violence on screens, but also by the sensory capacities we must generate to survive in a new landscape of work and exploitation, in which we are each tasked with leveraging every ounce of human capital, skills, relationships, hobbies, to compete in renting our time or assets to fickle micro-employers. For millions whose labor is no longer necessary to capitalist accumulation, Anesthetics dulls the pain of essentially being relegated to the status of prematurely dead in the eyes of the system. Capitalism needs no surplus army of the unemployed when it has already won the war. You have been listening to Our Opium Wars, The Ghosts of Empire in the Prescription Opioid Nightmare by Max Haven.